question? It's about eternal generation of the sun. Uh-huh. So can you can you deny eternal generation but still affirm the eternality of the sun? Or like are those can you affirm one but deny the other? Like or is that like a package deal? Um hmm. Uh, well obviously uh prior to Nicaea Um, there are numerous writers that we would consider to be Christians that would not utilize post-Nicene Orthodox terminology, and we have to try to put them in some type of a box as to where they would have fallen on these things, which is often mainly speculative. But there were subordinationist tendencies in a lot of writers. Um, That's really why why Nicaea had to happen, um, partially because uh, you part of the problem people need to realize is that the controversies that led up to Nicaea, first of all, it had included a rejection of mon- monarchical, you know, modalistic uh, a type of, of thinking, one we would call it oneness thinking today. So there had been an emphasis upon the the necessary, distinctions of the persons. But once that was settled in the sense that there was a general agreement that modalism was an error, uh, then there had to be a discussion of the relationships of the persons. And that's what leads to Arius and therefore to Nicaea. And then once you have the the assertion of the homoousius clause, that there is uh, that they're sharing one nature, the being of God, uh, is being shared by three divine persons. Now the question comes up, well, what's the relationship of the divine persons? Um, it's one thing economically, the economic trinity in, in redemption, but then theoretically prior to uh, creation, what? how are the divine persons distinguished from one another? This is the conversation that you probably heard that Doug Wilson and I had um, on this particular subject. And we Did you hear that? I did. I actually watched it yesterday. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So we talked about the opera ad intra and the opera ad extra, um, the internal operations of, 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 of the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's where you get into this issue. And this issue is in regards to the utilization, for example, the term monogonase in regards to Jesus. Um, and what you have is you, you have a development after Nicaea, um, through the Christological controversies, Apollinarianism, Eutychianism, Nestorianism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you have um, a general, and, and there, the, the stuff back in 2016 going on through today demonstrated that there's still disagreement as to exactly uh, how you would necessarily define post-Nicene orthodoxy, because both sides in the eternal subordination controversy, claimed post-Nicene orthodoxy as, as their own. Um, the issues primarily focus upon when you speak of the eternal generation of the Son, are we speaking solely in regards to an, identif- an I- identifying non-temporal relationship that could be that that flows out in words like we have in John 14, 15, 16, the, the Father and the Son send the Spirit, the, the Father sends the Son, the Father and the Son send the Spirit, proceeding from the Father and the Son. This is where you get all the issues of procession, spiration. These were all the terms that were being used in, in post-Nicene um, orthodoxy to, to talk about these things. And obviously, as I pointed out in, in the conversation with Doug, once you get past f- the the fundamentally correct assertion that the hypostatic union accurately reflects what the New Testament teaches about Jesus, they cruci- they they would not have crucified the Lord of Glory. The very phrase "crucified Lord of Glory," you can't crucify the Lord of Glory. But yes, you can because of the hypostatic union. But once you get to that point, you can once you go past that. Um, you start getting deeply into the weeds where you're, you're really not any longer able to bring 
direct scriptural uh, categories to bear. You're just you're just not because it's not something that the Holy Spirit has decided to make an an issue of revelation. And so at that point, you're getting into stuff where, well, it would be best not to say that because that might be taken to mean this down the road. And so many people don't think about these things that they might hold a position that, yeah, could be unorthodox down the road, but they don't, they never go there because they're, they're never pushed to go there. They never even think about those types of things and things like that. So when we talk about eternal generation, that can go either direction. If we, if we understand it in a uh, non-temporal identification category, um, similar to how C.S. Lewis described the same reality when he, he said, well, it's like you have two books. And if, in fact, I have two books right here, okay? So I've, I've got the Septuagint and I've got the Myths and Mistakes book. And uh, the Myths and Mistakes book is sitting on top of the Septuagint. And if I move the Septuagint, the Myth and Mistake book is going to fall. Um, so its position is dependent upon the Septuagint. So in a sense, you could say that the one is dependent upon the other. But what if they had eternally been like this? There had never been a time when this was not the situation. Then this that's what Lewis was talking about when he talked about Father and the Son, is that it's a it's a eternal, non-beginning relationship that simply allows us to distinguish the persons. Um, but it can't be taken into the subordinationist sphere, sphere of saying, well, that means the upper book is lesser than the lower book um, because it's eternally been that way. And so if you see eternal generation in that sense, that the son is in the bosom of the father, he always does what is pleasing to him, et cetera, et cetera, um, then you, you see the value in that type of language. Where it becomes problematic, from my perspective, as you heard in my conversation with Doug, is I think Calvin was right. Um, Calvin lived in a day when, and this is, this is, I think a lot of the conversation today takes place amongst people who never do meaningful apologetics outside of Christianity. They never deal with Muslims. They never deal with, with Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't deal with anybody. And so they're in the academy, but they're, the academy doesn't think apologetics is relevant. Calvin was not in that position, and Calvin lived in a day, he was a second-generation reformer, where you had all sorts of anti-Trinitarian groups rising up, claiming the authority of the Reformation, saying, hey, you guys overthrew what Rome taught on this, 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 and this. Why not this? And so he lived in a day where he, he recognized the absolute importance of making sure the foundations were absolutely firm, and he saw that if you take, um, as some post-Nicene writers did, and say that the concept of generation means that the son's essential participation in the being of God is mediated to him by the Father, and that therefore only the Father is autotheos, which means God of himself. The Son is not autotheos, the Spirit is even less autotheos. If you go there, there is no stopping place. There's no, there's no place you can attach a, a hook and stop the cart from going all the way down to rank subordinationism and Arianism. And I think Calvin was right. And so the issue is not so much the language of uh, eternal generation. The problem is of the, the, the problem is we read. Okay, the problem with the phrase "eternal generation of the Son" is that we read it out of order. What I mean by that is instead of starting with eternal, which automatically removes all concepts of temporality and therefore renders all relationships logical in nature rather than um, uh, temporal or time-based. Uh, we read it straight through. We, we, we don't read it straight through. We read the second term first and interpret everything else in light of that. So generation for us re absolutely speaks of priority, 
superiority, source, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in time and temporality. And so we lose the eternal part, which is supposed to get rid of the temporal categories. We read the generation part, and then if you take that so far as to then say only the Father is Altafeos, then you've got, I think, serious problems. Um, most of the conversation, the eternal subordination of the Son stuff in 2016 and since then, uh, some of it has gone to attempt to say that what we need to do is re-emphasize a proper understanding of the eternal generation of the Son um, that does not contain those concepts, but I have seen very little, um, and I, I could have missed it, I haven't tried to get every single article as it's come out, um, but um, I have seen very little concern about the sun as autotheos. And uh, that, for me, is, is extremely important. Extremely important. And I think there would be more concern about it if more of the people involved in the conversation were taking this conversation and its results. I... I, as you heard when I said to Doug, I just, I'm sorry, I really struggle with applying this stuff to human relationships between men and women. I, it's, it's backwards to me. It is just going at it the wrong direction. I hear the argument, but I just don't get it. That's right. That's why I pushed back on some of the language is that these are absolutely unique relationships that I do not see are mirrored in, in humanity. Um, and so when when you when you go that far, you end up, I think, creating some serious serious issues. Um, and if people were out more, I think, with people outside of the Christian faith, either either our our, our heretics like Jehovah's Witnesses, um, or outside that Islam things like that, uh, then they would uh, probably see why I'm as concerned about some of the language that is used as as I am. But so much of this conversation is just within the church and it's happening with amongst theologians that would, would almost never take the time to talk to somebody who is from, from another perspective. Cause they would go, that's, that's not my area. We leave that to other people. So, so that's, that's a concern for me. Did I touch on anything that was re relevant there? <laughs> yes. So you said um, something about Jesus and the father being, you said, Al to theos. What did you say? Alta theos is uh, alta is like the term uh, autonomy. Autonomy. Alta oh, okay. is simply the Greek word for self, and so alta theos means God in and of Himself, without uh, having to have Godship mediated to Him by someone else. So what I said was certain post Nicene writers sort of got to the point of saying that the eternal generation of the Son means that the Father is Theos, and then he mediates deity to the Son, but the Son is not Theos. And Calvin, I think, rightly said that that's going to lead to subordinationism. So I guess my answer to your question would be the, the phrase has a obviously a proper an orthodox interpretation, but it needs, I think it needs to be always utilized within the emphasis of the Son and the Spirit as Autotheos as well, to correct what I think is a natural misinterpretation on our part where we emphasize generation as um, a subordination-making characteristic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, brother.